It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sounds and the Consequence Podcast Network. Always thanks to, to you all who check out the series every single week. We have new interviews put out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I, I'm always so appreciative of you listening and, and leaving comments wherever you can. I love hearing from you, so thank you. Keep doing that. And if you're not a subscriber, uh, you know I hope you get inspired to do that. Whether this is your first time listening or, or, or fifth time listening, however you found us, or maybe you've never heard us before. It's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new artists and, and just uh, you know know what's happening in music these days. Uh, so wherever you're listening from, there's probably a subscribe button. Of course, you can find us at all the big places like iTunes and Apple Podcast, at uh, Spotify and YouTube. Just type in Kyle Meredith with and subscribe, and we'll deliver these new interviews to you uh, all throughout the week. Uh, I'm Kyle Meredith, and today my guest is a legend, Tori Amos. Uh, it's always such a huge honor to talk with Tori. And this time around, uh, we sort of get to talk about something even more special, and that's a brand new book. This is her second biography. It's called Resistance, A Songwriter's Story of Hope, Change, and Courage. And resistance is the very important word here. It is the theme. Uh, weaving in and out politics and wars and, and, and just national catastrophes that she's been a part of, that she's lived through, and, and those things that have made their ways into her songs. So she actually uh, explains a lot of her songs and, 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 and the historical context behind them. And of course, we're going to talk about all of that, but also the relationship that fans have with those moments, uh, not just with the words in the music, but also seeing Tori as, as a beacon, as someone they can turn to, as someone that they, they need advice from sometimes. I want to know about what that relationship is like to her, especially as a voice, as, as a mouthpiece of resistance. We'll hear about how a call to action song, ones with fury, ones with anger, ones with intent, uh, are very differently written than, you know, a love song, which sounds like obvious, but of course, I, I, we're going to get the details on how exactly that happens. And there's a new record. There's a new record in the work. She is, she's working on it right now uh, with her home studio. She's very fortunate to have a home studio, and in fact, most of her band is her family. Uh, she uh, produces and writes with her husband, and, and daughter is usually uh, featured on her songs as well. So we're going to hear how this album started versus where it's going now. Now that we are in the pandemic, now that we are in another crisis, has that changed the direction of the record. So there's a lot to get into. And, and again, uh, it's just one of my favorites right here. Uh, I'm so happy to introduce this one. I'm Kyle Meredith with Tori Amos. Hi, Kyle. Is everybody well and safe? You know, as much as we can. Uh, I mean, everybody is healthy uh, right now. And I hope you all are too. Yes, we are. So we're, we're grateful for that. We're in um, Cornwall here in the UK. We're in farm country. <laughs> yeah, that's where the house and the recording studio that's where that is here in um, where Mark used to to go he, as a child to the coast with his parents. So this is Mark's casa. So we're we're the good the good news is the farmers are up early and they're keeping the supply chain going and giving it their best. People don't talk a lot about the farmers, but I see I I see them out there on their tractors. Oh, they're going to keep the world going. That's for certain right now. Yeah, that's right. They don't get talked about a lot because there's so many other people on the front line that are risking their lives. And, and of course, it has to be acknowledged. But when I see the farmers and I, I don't know, there's something in me that says, okay, busy at work. Uh -huh. They see a future. They they want to make sure that there's everybody gets looked after as best as they can. So that gives me hope. Well, I want to talk about the book. I know, um, first off, I have to tell you how much I've enjoyed reading Resistance. Uh, it's such a unique way to tell this story. And, uh, and, and there's so much insight. So thank you first for doing it. You had written a, a book before, a biography before. I know you talk uh, about, especially towards the end, about uh, you know uh, your mother kind of encouraging you to go to your songs for remembrance. Beyond that, why did you want to dig deeper? What pushed you to, to, to kind of do a, a second run at, at your life story? Well, my editor, Rakesh um, Satchel, who is 
an amazing person and was involved in the first book that was written with Ann Powers, the journalist. Mm -hmm. So the difference is that Ann did a lot of the heavy lifting on the first book, piece by piece. And resistance, if you hate it, then you guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty because... He was a great editor and pushed me to, to write it. And he said to me in late 2017, when I was touring the record Native Invader, he came to the New York show and said, I think you need to write a story about the artistic process and writing during crisis. And if our democracy is at risk, do you feel a call to action as as a songwriter. And that was the beginning of the conversation. And you talk a lot about that. Really early on in the book, I think you use a term that I really loved about being in opposition to something is to be in a position of power, uh, which is an is an interesting flip uh, that I don't think I'd ever kind of taken in that, that context. But that meaning changes throughout the book, too, whether you're talking about uh, politics or whether you're talking about, you know, songwriting or, or however. When did you notice, like, those strong themes? Like, I guess you're, you're saying you went into it sort of with an idea of how it would be told. But was it very obvious as you were getting started that, that that's what it was, that resistance was the theme? Yes, we knew that. But we had thought it would be more of a Q&A type of book with him asking the questions and me supplying answers. And then we realized that wasn't telling the story that needed to, to be told, that people needed to travel in a time machine and go back. When I was in crisis, personally and collectively with the rest of the world, so the personal crisis of, of my failure in 1988, when my first record bombed, nobody really knew about it because it bombed so quietly, but it shook me to the core, which created Little Earthquakes, which was the record that took four years. And then that really began my solo career, which was released in 92. And so I felt like, you know, talking about the, the personal trauma is one thing and writing toward that. But then there's the collective trauma, which being in New York on 9-11 and then being um, Letterman's first music guest and, and my goodness, the, what do you call it, the, the pressure and the responsibility that I felt to address the nation's grief and do it, you know, really take it seriously because people were hurting, as you will remember. Mm -hmm. And you became... I mean, of course, your fans have turned towards you through the years as, as sort of a, a beacon uh, of different types. And, and obviously, you've become a spokesperson for resistance in many different ways. We've had these moments of crisis all, th you know, every decade, it seems. And obviously, we're in another one right right now. Uh, I would wonder, is it, does it feel different now than it used to be? Uh, especially, I don't know if, does it, I mean, when an artist looks to you, uh, when a fan looks to you like this, is it a weight? Did you ever feel like it's a weight that you've kind of thrown in your lap when, when they expect you to kind of show the way a bit? Well, it's a responsibility. And I think, you know, all artists are their own type of artist. And I would never, ever tell another artist how, how to address a time because I think you have to do it in the way that's genuine for you when you find your, your true north as an artist. And that wasn't easy for me to find. It took me a while to find it. Um, I had to have a failure and listen to the commercial suits at the record label and, you know, wear a bustier and try and, and be a rock chick that, frankly, I just couldn't pull that off because it was disingenuous. So I think once you find what type of writer you are, as Tasha said to me, when Netflix called me up a while ago and, and wanted to do a project, and I said to her, oh, Tash, Netflix, that should be fun. And in her British accent, she said, you know, Mum, sorry to break your heart, but no one really calls you for fun. <laughs> so, so that's, therefore, I'm writing now at the time for the new record. And of course, this crisis that we're going through and the stories I'm hearing from people and the experiences, and people are having so many different types of experiences, and they're asking amazing questions. I mean, they really are, Kyle, mm -hmm. incredible questions. 
Like, will we get our freedoms back right. like we had before? Will we? I mean, so when when I get these questions from, I don't call them fans, really. I call them sort of my intel. Mm-hmm. They're, they're sort of my MI6, boots on the ground. <laughs> and, and these songs... I believe you've called them in the book to, uh, you know, a call to action sometimes when the, when the muses are speaking to you in, in, a, in a certain way, it becomes a call to action, it, which I, I don't know, may, might be different when you're writing a song like that than where you would write, you know, uh, something that isn't. Uh, I'll generically say a love song or something like that. Are the words chosen differently then? Uh, does it become a very different type of, of way that you write when it is something uh, that speaks to a moment like this? Yes. It's about intention. And it's about sometimes with a moment like this, you're dealing with a collective grief and huge loss. And if you're called to write to that, you know, that that is a weight because not everybody will be called to do that. And I respect those artists who will want to bring laughter and we will need laughter, no question. But I am a Libra moon, so I'm always looking for the balance. And people will be bringing laughter um, when it's appropriate and when it's time. But we also need to address how we got into this situation. And we have to address the corruption, and we have to address the consequences of not preparing when we've been being warned about something like this. And that's the type of writer that I am some of the time. Sometimes it's it's more about personal loss, like losing my mother. And anybody who's lost somebody that they love, I think, will really resonate with that. I had no idea what grief was until I lost my mother. And I've lost people that I cared for. I, I don't know how to say it, Kyle. It's not like I'm totally heartless. but And it hurt. And I missed him. But when I lost my mother, I mean, my world fell to pieces. I was in absolute pieces for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that's really when the book started to come together. And when I wrote that, my editor, Rakesh, called me up and said, OK, I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is I love the Mary chapters. Now, the bad news is you now need to rewrite the book on that level. And so after a year and a half of writing, I had to rewrite the book in three months. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I did because, because you know, Kyle, sometimes as this is the same with records, too. You think you're going down the right road and you think you're telling the story and then you realize you, you have that kismet moment. There are those eureka moments where you go, oh, my God, that's the energy I need to be working with, that kind of passion for my subject. So that's just what being an artist is about. Well, you know, let me be the millionth person to compliment you on, on how you write your lyrics, too, because... Uh, that's one of the most, uh, well, that's one of your greatest traits, the most unique things about you. There are, especially, you know, it's one thing to hear a song, uh, and obviously a, a different thing to just read the lyrics on, on a page. And when I read Ophelia out loud, it's a song that I had heard before, uh, um, several times, many times, I don't know, but uh, it hit me how you take those moments that you're talking about, uh, that even the moments of anger and intent and purpose become sort of um, fragile uh, in a way or, or delicate. Like, when I read it, it was so very close to how I interpreted, like, Allen Ginsberg's America, if you're familiar with that poem. It's like a protest from a place of love. Wow. You know. Well, well, that's quite, that's quite a compliment. That's very humbling. What happened with the, the lyric idea is... Kavita, a friend of mine, was cooking dinner for me. She's an amazing cook. She's British Indian, and I love Indian food. And we were having a little too much wine that night. And at a certain point, she just looked at me and said, please don't take this the wrong way, T. And I, I, I really like your songs and everything, but I have no idea what you're talking about because I can't hear music and lyrics at the same time. I just can't do that. So she asked me to read lyrics to her. This was like two years ago. And so I read them to her. I just started talking to her. And she said, well, I never knew that it meant that. I never heard it that way. And so on the audio book, I'm reading the lyrics 
probably for the first time because they, they've been so connected to the music. For me, they're a marriage. They were constructed together. That's their, their DNA. But I've been taught the songs are teaching me that they wanted to live in this form too, in spoken word form. So that's just been this crazy, most challenging thing I've ever done is write a book. I don't know if I'd recommend it or if I'd ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping there was going to be an audio version where you did that. I didn't know that there was, but I, I was hoping that there was. So I look forward to to hearing that as well. That was, um, yeah, it took, it took a, a whole week of a, a lot of recording to do it because it's it's one thing reading something you've written. It's another thing reading it out loud and make getting the tone right, making sure my tone is right and that, that it doesn't take the, the listener down the wrong path. Well, I want to quickly, you, you mentioned it, and I do want to ask about, you know, how this, how this has affected uh, the new record that you're working on. Because in the book you were saying that, you know, hopefully this was uh, going to be a record that was going to be out uh, around... Uh, the election, and and that would make sense with a lot of things you're talking about. I, I would wonder if things have changed because the world has stopped, and that includes even pressing plans for for physical music. But but also because of the way the book ends, um, has what's currently happening uh, with with COVID uh, changed any of the songs or or the direction of the album uh, as well as well uh, as the way the book ends as well? Absolutely, it's changing the record as we speak. And people would call my British husband, who who is a bit grumpy, um, but funny, and says he usually should never be allowed to meet anybody because his cynicism. Not everybody gets British humor, and it took me years to get it. But anyway, my point is, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, many I, I can't count. So 23 years ago, he was uh, called by his voices to come back to Cornwall here in England and build in the middle of nowhere. And musicians from L.A. would fly in or wherever, New York, and go, okay, you guys live in the middle of nowhere with all these farmers. There's no street lights. There's no town for 30 minutes, okay? There's no, like, proper store or anything. And people would kind of giggle because, you know, it smells like farm. But then you kind of think, oh, my goodness, well, in a time like this, where we're all under not house arrest, but where we are, you know, quarantining, right? I just walk outside and into the barn, and there's this Star Trek recording studio with a Busendorfer, front, and I say, oh, my God, my crazy, grumpy husband isn't so crazy <laughs> after all. <laughs> so, I'm, of course, the record's changing. It, how could it not if you're going to write towards what people are going through right now, which is... You've talked about we face crises before, but this this is affecting people on every level, um, and it and it has to be. I think it's an opportunity for artists to hear what people are going through and to try and put that into their art form. Well, I, I look forward to hearing how that all results. And the last time we talked to a native invader, I complimented your husband's guitar playing on Up the Creek as well. It's still uh, a high note for me. So uh, grumpy or not, uh, I love the way you all work together. It's always well, like, it's I'll good. tell him that. Maybe maybe he'll make me a nice margarita after <laughs> I tell him that. <laughs> I know we all probably need one. Tori, it's, uh, it's been such an honor and a pleasure once again to talk to you. Thank you so much for everything that you do and put out in the world. Uh, it's always appreciated. Well, thank you, Kyle. And I just want to send big air hugs to to your listeners because everybody's going through so many emotions at this time. So I just want to send a big air hug and to say, you know, people, you guys are resilient. You're you're more powerful than you realize, and we we can get through this. Yes, we're going to lose people, and that's tragic. But we have to try and be there for each other. So I just want to send air hugs to all those on the front line, and to all those artists who we're going to need. So I thank you for all you do, Kyle. All right, thank you. It's a beautiful. We appreciate sentiment. it. Yeah, take care. Okay, you too. Tori Amos again. The new book. 
is called Resistance, a songwriter's story of hope, change, and courage. Now, I referenced the first time Tori and I talked within that interview, and that was back in 2017 when she had just released the record Native Invader. And this was a record about basically our very existence being at stake. It was filled with songs that were written after the November election. Uh, Tori was singing of environmental concerns, her Native American ancestry, and the political landscape backed with the sweeping piano runs and slicing guitar solos, as I mentioned. So I'm going to include that interview here as well as part two of Kyle Meredith with Tori Amos. Hey, Kyle, how's it going? I'm, I'm really excited to be talking to you. I, I feel like you've done a beautiful record as well as a frightening record. You're taking on a lot of big topics on here, but I, I, I see what you've done, and, and it's sort of a master tr- stroke because instead of just talking about these big topics, it seemed like you went for the people and, and the person in those moments. I guess um, the music said to me, listen, you have to stop reacting, Tori. They, that's not productive, not for you. Everybody has different ways of expressing themselves, but you need to do it through songs. And we're going to send you these songs, but you, you need to create a safe space. You need to be a safe space, T, because we're sending you a sonic secret garden a sonic wildwood, and that means that within it, there'll be things that people can take from this sonic world um, that may be resilience, may be questions, but it's not going to be destructive. We're not not planting destructive seeds, and we have to outcreate this destructive energy. I was thinking... You know, when you when you get online and everything, it's just it's just so much noise that's happening when everyone's arguing, even amongst themselves. But with this record, it's almost like you could see the whites of their eyes. You know, it's not just everyone screaming; it's actually a conversation. And I guess that's so important when you're well, making art. Well, yes, because somebody said to me, "I'm losing friends, and I've lost myself to being consumed on certain days." and I could feel the tears and the emotion, and it it seemed to me, well, all right, we we all have to remember that we're all creative forces. It might be that somebody's creative in the kitchen, or a gardener, or they write stories, or it, it could be many different ways of creating. But when somebody said, this friend, I'm losing this friend because I don't know who they are. They're so angry now. I can't find my friend anymore. And I found that incredibly heartbreaking. And those kinds of stories ended up in songs on Native Invader. I mean, I've gone through the same stuff with my family. It's so weird and rough, uh, you know, beyond what I've ever experienced. Papa said to me, my grandfather in the 60s, he said to me, you know, we haven't recovered as a, as a community, as a family, not just our family, but America hasn't recovered yet from the Civil War in the 19th century. And this was in the 60s, 100 years later. And that is really um, something that's come back, his voice telling me that, because I haven't seen this energy in my life. I'm 54 now. And yes, in the late 60s, we had division and there were tensions and it was divisive. But there seems to be something else, a a different quality, almost, whether it's fear-based, because hate usually is a place coming from fear. Fear of, of the other. Fear of something not a reflection of you. And I just remember Papa saying that. So I turned to the muses in times of crisis, that's for sure. Well, speaking of crisis, I mean, there's a lot of this record that is about environmental crisis that could happen, that is happening. Does it add any weight that all this is coming out at the same time that something like Hurricane Harvey, you know, has wreaked havoc over the South? I mean, is it one of those moments like, can't you see what's happening? Well, that's, we've all been watching, watching from London, the tragedy of Houston and the other cities affected by Hurricane Harvey. And what you you ask yourself, what will it take to get to people that we have to not deny anymore, that we we are in crisis and we, we have to act. So that's just what we need to do now. I mean, here in Kentucky, you know, Louisville is a blue town in a red state, but it seems like we all band together and no matter how big we shout, there's this one guy who just doesn't listen and, and nothing changes. And it's very frustrating. It, it, it makes me start thinking about the whole thing about, you know, thinking globally, acting locally, just turning around and trying to fix the space that you're in. 
Yes, but but it seems it seems as if our teenagers are waking up, and I take heart in that. After the states pulled out of the Paris Accord, Cash looked at me and just said, "Mom, grown-ups are messing with my generation's future, and could be killing our future." And I said, "Yes, I I understand what you're saying." And she said to me, "Well, we have to do something." So we joined forces. Uh, she's singing on up the creek, and and it was it was really inspiring to to see the world from her eyes and her passion, her commitment. Uh, by the way, you know, I I just so we've been playing up the creek in like heavy rotation for two or three weeks already, and it wasn't until studying for this interview last night that I realized that she even sings on it. Like I've heard that so many times, and it never hit me that that wasn't you. Your voices are so close. <laughs> Well, yeah, she's a, she starts the song. I I'm the desert sister gal, but she's she's good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. It's amazing how well you two blend together. I mean, now that I hear it, now that I know it, I completely hear it. Well, we jam a lot together. If I'm honest with you, we enjoy jamming, and she um, she's been playing the acoustic guitar for a while, but she discovered her dad's pedals and his Marshall stack of, of speakers. And so um, she's been wailing on an electric guitar now. So her style is starting to change. It changes very quickly. And by the way, uh, props to your, your husband. The guitar playing on this is pretty mesmerizing as well. Is that also him on the uh, Up the Creek as well? Oh, yeah. It just shreds in all the right moments. Like. <laughs> You know, playing with that title a little bit, I've heard you talk about it sort of in a, as much a positive light as a negative light, and it's, it is interesting to play with it, and I dare use the word fun when we're talking about topics like this, but in this very specific sense, it is very fun to play with that title, especially when you're looking at it, you know, nature versus historical human moments, but it all seems like it equals to we're killing ourselves. Native invader from different perspectives means different things. Mary had a stroke, and that is a native invader, and there's no positive side to that. Tash is also a native invader, having sort of squatted in, in mommy condo for nine months, um, rent-free. But uh, that was a win-win, a symbiotic relationship. So sometimes, depending on what lens you're looking at, the words native invader, can seem like a paradox and that those two can't live together. But actually, we have to reinvade certain words like freedom, certain words like liberty. We, we have to reinvade, find their DNA, replant that DNA, those seeds, put them deep down into earth and let them take root. It's hard to stay optimistic, but it sounds like you're optimistic, and I'm going to try to hold on to that. You know what? We, we have to believe in the youth. Juliana versus the United States woke me up. The Benjamins woke me up. Benjamins can be women, young women, as well as young men. And um, they were sending me messages through people. Did I understand what was going on? Did I really understand? Not, not about one person or two people, but did I understand the consequences for our planet, for our youth, for ourselves, clean water, what that means? And so... What, in, what has encouraged me, Kyle, is that the youth are waking up and are taking their planet back. Yeah. The militia of the mind, they are rising. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by them. I'm encouraged by their commitment to their planet and, and their philosophy and responsibility. Choosing, they're going to make life choices. They are going to. And and they're, it, it, what I'm seeing is, is they're making choices because they want a healthy planet. It is a crisis point. They know they're in crisis. But they're, what I'm seeing is they want to act and want to be mm, make a change and be that change. Well, powerful words, and, uh, and I, I think that's a good place to kind of wrap it up here, too. I, I really appreciate talking to you today, Tori, and you taking the time. And, and this, this record, uh, like I said, is, is just fantastic. I've loved every, every bit of it. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for having me. No problem, and we'll see you around.
Okay, rock on. All right, take care. Bye. Again, that uh, that interview back from 2017, talking about the Tori Amos record, Native Invaders. Uh, one more time, the new book is called Resistance, A Songwriter's Story of Hope, Change, and Courage. I highly recommend it. It is a, a wonderful, insightful read, uh, especially in the times that we are in right now. So a huge thanks to Tori Amos, and a huge thanks to you as well for listening uh, to this entire episode. Thank you so much for checking us out. Again, if you're not a subscriber, I do hope uh, you're inspired enough to hit that button to keep up with us, keep up with your favorite uh, artists, and discover new artists and everything that's happening in music. Just type in Kyle Meredith with at wherever you get podcasts from, including iTunes and Apple Podcasts and Spotify and YouTube as well. And after that, you can head to WFPK.org, where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres and music news and anniversary spins and bonus interviews as well. Again, that's WFPK.org. Consequenceofsound.net has your music and film news. You can also find me on just about any social media platform at Kyle Meredith. I hope you like and follow along over there as well. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. Do you read Stephen King? Good news. There's a club for you. The Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights.